forward. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Maria Bernier from the Connecticut State Library. My pronouns are she and her, and I am the Construction Grant Administrator at the State Library. And I am here very briefly just to get us all in the room and host the Zoom, but really you're all here to hear from Michaela Hall, who is the Library Director at Stonington Free Library, and Denise Easton, who is the Library Board's Co-President as well as chair of the building committee. So I am going to turn you over to them. Michaela, over to you. Thank you so much, Maria. And thank you for everyone for joining us today um, and for Maria to inviting us for, to give this presentation and also to the Connecticut State Library Construction and Fiber Grant Program for making a huge part of this project possible. As Maria said, I'm Michaela Hall. I'm the director of Stonington Free Library and Denise Easton is also joining me today. She's the co-president and building committee chair and the project wouldn't have been the success that it was without her. So today we're gonna to go in and discuss and share some photos of our recent addition and renovation project. And our building project, just as some background, happened in two phases. First, we had the addition, second, we had the renovation, and it took about 13 months to complete altogether. And this right here is a wonderful watercolor that we had made by a local artist, Howard Park of the addition. And this is the actual addition right here in the middle. So this is the library's third edition, and I wanted to give a little history um, of the building. So in the front here, this is the original building and it was completed in 1900. On the other side of the edition, there's actually a middle section that was completed in 1956. And then in the back here, this is the rear edition, which was completed in 1990. So it's kind of like a capital I shape I'd describe it as, and you'll see that a little better in upcoming floor plans. And what we kind of did was filled out the, the middle section of one of those sides with the addition. So this right here, this is, I wanted to give a view of the original building. This was completed in 1900, as I mentioned, and it's just a beautiful uh, historic building. You'll see some more views of inside and further into the presentation. And I'm gonna pass it over to Denise for this slide. Take it away, Denise. Great, thank you everybody for joining us today. And thank you again, Maria. And um, the kudos really belong to Michaela and the staff because this project would never have, have happened without 110,000% commitment. Um, and what I really want to talk about as before we get into the details is the fact that we had complete buy-in from our entire community. And we kept saying, this is a small project, but it has a huge impact. One, it has a huge impact on the community. It had a huge impact in fulfilling many of our goals, if not all of them, from the mission. And then even more importantly, it allowed us the opportunity to address our strategic initiatives. And most importantly, it was accessibility for everybody and anybody who wanted to come to the library. And then things happened and we'll go through some of the timing, but even more importantly, I wanted to say that as we were guided by this process, it was in large part because we had done a strategic plan. And the strategic plan was guided by um, looking at the community and recognizing that every community shifts and we wanted to know, well, what do the people who use the library need? And very consistently, since the very beginning of the library, we wanted to engage the community and extend the reach of the Starting to Free Library. It's a magnificently beautiful building. We invite any and all of you to come and visit us. And we're open seven days a week. Um, and we wanted to be very sensitive to, which we were, the physical space. So we weren't going to be adding giant wings and going up three stories because it's in the middle of when you come over this viaduct into um, the community, Stonington Borough, you have to drive by um, Wadawadic Square, Wad Square is what we call it. And right in the middle is this building. And everybody who comes into town, the first thing they say, if they have not been here before is, ooh, what is that building? Where is it? And it's the library. And that sort of embodies the spirit of how we are as a community. So as we had to reimagine, renew, and restore our physical space, we had to be very sensitive. And we'll go into that a little bit more. But number one, if you look at a 
the building, people will say, we didn't know that you did anything. So it was extraordinarily sensitive to the environment. And we were very careful about engaging the community throughout the entire process. And then we wanted to look at the sustainability of the library for future generations. Um, the next slide, Michaela. Yeah, and I can. Thanks, go, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I guess I no can problem. too, but I'm going to let you do it since we haven't no said it. No problem. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, so I just wanted, we'll go through this, but the, the two goals that were specifically addressed um, in this overall arching campaign and project were goals B and goal C. And um, I'm going to turn back over to Michaela, but we've continually referred to all of them in every single document and conversation that we've had was to look at the sustainability for the library. And the sustainability is both physical, it's, um, you know, sort of the soft sustainability community, how are we going to look forward, and then also from the actual funding. So that has been part and parcel of everything we've done. So I'll turn it back to you, Michaela. Thank you, Denise. So as Denise mentioned, we were actively working on both the strategic plan at the same time as we were trying to improve our accessibility and space. So accessibility, improving our use of space, updating furnishings, electrical infrastructure, our Wi-Fi speed, those are all included in goal uh, B of our strategic plan. And in my opinion, we pretty much met every single objective in goal B through this project. Uh, then we were also working on goal C, which relates to this project all about sustainability. We were awarded $100,000 from the town in municipal funding towards this project. It was $50,000 over two years. We also applied for and were awarded a lot of state and local grant opportunities. And then we also completed a $1.8 million capital campaign. And this raised the funds for both the building project and to increase our endowment. So essentially anything that we didn't spend on the building project then went into our endowment for future financial sustainability. And we'll get into more about the uh, project costs and the capital campaign a little bit later. And as Denise mentioned, we held community and staff focus groups, a community survey, a board retreat, a community conversation. So this all helped us gain community staff and board feedback. And this feedback shaped both the strategic plan, um, goals and objectives, and then also the building project itself. So as I mentioned before, we this project was done in two phases. We had the accessibility addition first. So this added 700 square feet of new space. So 350 square feet on each level, all about ADA compliance. We added a new ramp, elevator, bathroom and storage closet on both the main and the lower level. And then we also had an automatic side door opener put on the side entry where the ramp is. The interior renovation, we freed up 575 square feet of space. And how we did that was we removed some existing elements in the building. So that's an existing stairwell, three bathrooms, a storage closet, and an old wheelchair lift. So the bathroom and storage closets we regained in the addition. Obviously, the wheelchair lift was replaced by the elevator in the addition. It was okay to remove the stairwell per code because we had another one in the building which we refurbished during the renovation. We also added lots of flexible furnishings, mobile shelving. We upgraded our internet to, uh, to fiber and that was thanks to the grant from the Connecticut State Library. We also added uh, lots of new electrical outlets, especially under the table. So we have a lot of new floor outlets right under where patrons are working because before we had this incredible problem with people stringing cords and walking paths and it was just, it would make me go, oh my goodness, someone is going to trip and fall. And then we also added lots of new comfortable chairs that have the outlets and the USB uh, ports for, for charging in that. So most of the renovation work was actually done in the 1956 and the 1990 edition, which you'll see. Uh, in the original building, we did some polishing of the original terrazzo floors, marble stairs and column bases. And then we have a lot of new paint carpet and PCT tile throughout. So where did the project all began? And so it all began with this old wheelchair lift, which was installed during the 1990 edition. 
Unfortunately, we had two floods in the lower levels in July 2009 and March 2010, and that flooding just unfortunately led to this lift to stop, stop working because a lot of the mechanicals were down in this lower level, and this is where the flooding happened, right in this area. Uh, so we were not serving our mission of free and equal access for all. Those unable to use the, use the stairs could not get between the two levels, and just as some background, our children and our teen room uh, is located in the lower level. And then again, just families with strollers would have to take their children out of the strollers, leave them upstairs on the main level. And it was just a lot. We did have families actually with triplets, which was just like, oh my goodness, how did they manage that? So and we Michaela, had, also from yes. a practical point of view, there's no way to get a book truck downstairs prior to this, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so you got to think about the workload yep. on your staff and moving materials around. So, so many reasons to replace that. Absolutely. And you'll see um, as I get into this, because we, we really need flexible programming space and our programs mostly happen on the main level. So, but then storage was on the lower level. So it was a lot of staff carrying things up and down stairs. So it has been, oh my goodness, so wonderful to have that elevator now. And you can see we were really using this as, as storage because we're so limited on that because it didn't work and we didn't want to put anyone in it. So a repair company, we hired a repair company in about 2015, and unfortunately, they just could not get it to function to our safety satisfaction. So we decided, okay, it's time to start calling around and checking in with lift companies to see if replacement of this was an option. We ultimately learned that this lift was actually a non-standard, non-compliant size, even when it was installed in 1990. And only one of the three companies we contacted even gave us a proposal to uh, replace it. And we just were really skeptical about that. So we decided, hey, you know, let's try to reach out to an outside third party uh, for some opinions on how to move forward with this. And this brought us to the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, which I have learned now is actually Preservation Connecticut. So sorry if I say Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, but that's what it was when we were uh, working with them. And we wanted to reach out to them, see if they had any suggestions. Um, this was a, a board idea, um, which worked out great. So we were provided with a lot of great insight and advice. So they sort of told us, hey, you know, your current lift arrangement um, is really inhospitable for those needing to use it. Uh, and if you replace it with another non-standard unit, you know, you're really not going to be able to accommodate like large motorized wheelchairs. And then we would also have to be reconfiguring doors to the entrance to that stairwell because the doors would not afford uh, wheelchair accessibility as they were. So ultimately, after talking with Preservation Connecticut, we just thought their observations and suggestions provided us with a lot of broader consideration for alternatives. Uh, the representative really felt there was a lot of opportunities to improve accessibility without sacrificing the historic character of the library. And they also provided us with uh, a few references to architects who they felt were really experienced with historic buildings, knowledgeable about access requirements, fire code, and all of that. So we ultimately concluded after speaking with them that the best way to proceed would be through the assistance of a professional architect. Uh, so next we started preparing a request for a proposal to the three architectural firms that Preservation Connecticut provided us with, but unfortunately we were really disappointed that none of them decided to respond to our RFP. Our speculation was that the project was really small for them to consider, but um, however, at the very same time, I was actually in the midst of talking to uh, professional interior designers, you know, thinking about what might we want to do in the building to refurbish with our strategic plan work. And so I ended up asking the three interior designers I was working with, um, hey, you know, would you also be willing to help us with accessibility improvements? Are there, you know, architectural people in your firms that could help us with that as well as refurbishing the interior? And thankfully they were all interested and submitted proposals. So that was one of the things we were like, oh no, you know, we didn't get any proposals. How do we move forward? And it was just really, it worked out perfectly with the strategic plan and looking for interior designers at the same time. So now we had to figure out, okay, well, how do we now 
okay uh, for an architect to, you know, design these accessibility improvement plans. We're talking about, you know, a good number of fees involved here. So we have a development coordinator and our development coordinator at the time started researching grant opportunities and we ultimately applied for and were awarded a grant from the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation. Um, we were actually only awarded half the amount we requested, but then the board approved library spending so that we could cover the remaining half to move forward. Um, we ultimately selected do right design out of West Hartford as our architectural firm and they were our firm for both the addition and the renovation. Our architect was Steve Dewey um, and he let us know actually that the old lift we couldn't really replace it with the compliant one in the existing location due to fire code so that did not was not a viable option at all for us so Steve ended up putting together about eight different plans to improve our accessibility. They included placing the lift in various locations in the existing building, which would eat up a good chunk of space we felt, and then also some small addition options outside of the existing building. And the board ultimately selected the option that we went with because it really provided us with so much for the price. We were, you know, we're very space challenged here. It would free up valuable space inside of the building that we could repurpose. We would be installing an elevator instead of a lift. We would gain two ADA compliant bathrooms on each level, which we did not have before. And then our ramp would become ADA compliant as well. It was not fully compliant before. So now we're going to start to get into some before and after pictures. So this right here, this is the addition. And you can see that it really does not extend outside the original building and the 1990 uh, addition here. So just so, for some background, we own the library building, but we do not own the land. So we do not own Wadawanek Square, which it sits on. That is owned by the borough of Stonington. So we needed their permission in order to move forward with this project. And I really do think that keeping it inside of this space helped us to easily gain approval. And as Denise mentioned, we also really wanted to, it to you know, seem like the addition was all, always there. The architect really did a great job with selecting the brick color for the addition. It really blends very well with the three slightly different uh, brick colors of the original buildings and the other two additions. And we also tried to tie it in. So this decorative motif, this is the elevator shaft right here, which is why it's a little taller. Um, we put this on here and you'll see, we kind of have this in the original building and in other elements of the 1956 and the 1990 edition. And we have really received numerous compliments from the community about how it looks like it was always there. And this is, this is the new ramp. So with the new ramp, what we did was we extended it out further. So when you get over to the front here, this is actually the, the library driveway. So before you'll see, it was really hidden back here behind this original building. You couldn't really see it. So this makes it much more visible um, at the head of the driveway. And our book drop is right over here as well. So this is our main level floor plan. This is the addition right here. This is the bathroom, the entryway, the elevator, and the storage closet. And then here's the ramp. Um, and just so that you, I wanted to point out some of the elements where we were able to free up space as well. So this was the main stairwell between the two levels. So we removed this. And then this stairwell, which we already had in the 1990 edition, we refurbished this and this became our main stairwell between the two levels. Uh, we also removed this bathroom and the storage closet and we obviously regained the bathroom and storage closet in the addition. This is where the wheelchair lift was. So this was removed and then we gained the elevator. And you can't see it in this floor plan, but this is our staff area behind the front desk. And we had a kitchenette back here. So we actually took out that kitchenette and then we put it down in the lower level, which you will see where we removed two existing bathrooms. So we have, uh, you know, our staff space is really small. So this helped open this up as well. This is the lower level. So really the same plan as the main level. We have bathroom, little entryway, elevator, storage closet. Again, since the stairwell was removed, we freed up all of this space in here. This is where the lift was removed, freed up space there. And these two bathrooms, which were so teeny, teeny, tiny, we removed these. And this is where that uh, kitchenette was moved to downstairs. So I want to play a little video and I'll narrate. So this is going to be the new addition on the main level, just to give you an idea. So hopefully this is playing. Is it playing, Maria? Good. So we're walking up 
the ramp right now. Uh, this is the side entry door. I'm going to hit the little push button for our automatic door opener and in we go. So this is the elevator on the right. This is the new addition. Over to the left, we have our community information area and that bathroom. And we're walking into the 1956 edition. This is our main reading room and programming space. So lots of new paint, carpeting, flexible furniture in here. And here are those floor outlets I mentioned, which we put all over. This is the storage closet. Uh, now we're walking into the 1990 edition. We did a lot of work on the stacks here, which I'll talk about. We have a little workroom over to the left here. Again, all new furniture, flexible on wheels, carpet, um, carpet tiles and paint. And this is the little workroom over on the right. Again, all new furniture back here, paint carpet tiles as well. So this is the lower level now, and we are going down in the elevator. And here we go, opening up to the addition on the lower level. We have the bathroom here, and this is the children's room. So down here, we have all new top and end panels on the shelves. We really lowered the height of the shelves down here, gained some mobile units. Um, this is the storage closet for the addition over here. And then we also have some new comfortable seating, and we'll have picture, more pictures coming up of before and after of both levels. So here we go view into the main reading room elevator, another view of the elevator and the entryway here. And this is our push button from inside. And just like many of us, I'm sure we have lots of the hand sanitizer units that we've mounted around the building, community information area and restroom. And there's another view of that elevator. So now we're getting into our main level reading room with some before and after pictures. So this room is both our main reading room and our programming space. So when we hold a speaker program, all the tables are moved out, the chairs are used for program seating. We have a mounted projector screen that comes down. Um, then we also bring out like a little small table and set up our projector with this floor outlet right here. We rearrange for our smaller gatherings, all the tables and chairs in this room. So things like book groups and knitting groups. The old furniture you'll see really heavy, really bulky. It was actually falling apart. Like we would have to tell volunteers and staff, don't lift them up, just slide them or else the legs will, will fall off. So not flexible at all, really mismatched. And we were even using folding tables and chairs for, for some things. Also, just not enough tables for the public. We only have two tables um, in this room. And this is where that bathroom and storage closet were. And this is where that stairwell was. So you'll see, we gained so much valuable space in this room. And then we also gained more shelving units in this area. And now we have so much more seating, so flexible. Everything is on wheels, the chairs, they can stack if needed. The tables, actually, they have the little bars that you can pull underneath and then they kind of fold up and you can nest them together. And this really makes rearranging this room for programs so much easier. And I think we even have like probably space for about 30 more seats back here when we do hopefully hold big in-person programs again. But Kayla, while we're on this slide, mm -hmm. um, we have a question about where your tables came from. What oh, so that will, so I will go over at the end our contractors, but we worked with Rob Romay from Robert H. Ford Company to pick out all of our furniture. And so that's, he helped us out with this. I can't remember the exact manufacturer. Um, I, I can look it up and let you know though, Maria. So in this space too, we added lots of those floor outlets I've been talking about. So they're really close to all of these tables. So people can just plug right in rather than stringing cords in walking paths, all new carpet tiles. So easy if you know something, one tile gets ruined, we can just throw down another tile before we had wall to wall uh, carpeting in here and then all new paint. So it really just a lot brighter, a lot newer looking. I think it you know had a big impact here. So I wanted to show some pictures of our programs in this space before. So this right here is our old book group, pretty much took up the whole entire room. And we were using a combination of those heavy 
tables and chairs and then folding tables. So as Maria was mentioning earlier, all of our six foot folding tables were wonderfully stored in the lower level. So staff would constantly be going up and down the stairs with these folding tables when we had uh, these programs because we just did not have the space to store them on the, on the main level. So this is our, one of our speaker programs, how we kind of rearrange the space for when we have speakers. That's that screen that I was talking about and our little projectors uh, stand. And on many occasions, we just filled up the space and we had people sitting on folding chairs all the way back into the original building. And obviously when you get that far back, it's just really hard to, to see and hear. Uh, so now we really, we really, really needed flexible furniture and more space, and we really got both of that thanks to this project. It is so easy to reconfigure the space with the light movable furniture. We have more tables and chairs. We had the elevator um, and space for more attendees. I unfortunately don't have any uh, pictures of programs in the uh, happening in the renovation space now because this is one of the downsides. We just have been doing more virtual, and when we do have programs, they're they're relatively small just because of everything going on with COVID. But we are going to start having having more programs um, next month. So fingers crossed. So this is another view of that uh, main reading room, just looking towards the 1990s edition and the main stacks. And this is that entryway to the, to the new edition right here. So this is our main stack area. So what we did here was we really changed out three sections of each of these really tall stacks that just had little display opportunities for these step down mobile units. And it really makes it feel so much more spacious, open and bright. It improved our sight lines to these work rooms on either side here to the left and the right. And we just have so much more display space than we've ever had before. And this has really helped with circulation and the staff really have so much fun with coming up with new uh, display themes for these. Mm -hmm. Again, that new carpet tile and paint throughout, a new podium on wheels. So our old podium, same thing as before with the tables, heavy, legs falling off. So this, this is huge help for when we're doing programs. Michaela, well, if we could go back to, to look a little bit more at those step down shelving units. Mm -hmm. uh, I love these because they really do pull you into the room visually. They're not that enormous tall barrier right at the beginning. Is this um, something that Rob Romy suggested from Robert H. Lord company? How did that idea come up? So that actually came up through our interior designer. That's Deanna Dewey of 4D Design and Decorating. And I know she comes to several of you know, the CLA conferences and that, so you'll see her there. And I will um, go over again in the contractors. She, she helped us and she came up with this idea and then her and Rob Rome uh, worked out like, you know, how, what level should we step them down at? So this was a combination of both Deanna and, and Rob and we purchased the shelving through Rob. Thank you. You're welcome. This is still the, the 1990 edition, and this is the workroom on the left-hand side of the stack. So again, in here, all new flexible tables, chairs, floor outlets, just like in the main reading room. No more of that heavy mismatched furniture. And the nice thing about here is sometimes we have small gatherings. So now that we have those mobile um, stacks, we could actually expand the space a little more if needed. Um, and then again, new paint and new carpet tiles back here as well. This is the workroom over to the right hand side of the stacks. Again, all new tables and chairs in here. These ones aren't as flexible, but we do find that we need less flexibility in this space compared to the others. And actually, so this, this little set of tables and chairs here, this was actually originally in our staff area. And we moved it here recently because we just felt like it was taking up a lot of space. We were not sitting at it and working at it. We were just piling stuff up on it. And so it wasn't being used as intended. So we were like, oh, let's just put it over there and see how it goes, free up some more space. So. Um, we have we have seen that, you know, we, in the original plans, we said, oh, this would be great. But then when we actually saw it, we're like, oh, that's like a little too crowded or not being you know, quite utilized as we thought. So we've moved stuff around here and there over time and it's worked out really well. This is the original building. So like I said, so construction of this began in 1898 and it finished in 1900. This is the main entrance right here. And this is our front desk. Behind our front desk is our very small staff area. So this is actually my desk where I am right now. And then over on this side, we have the assistant director's desk. And then we also have another little work area for staff. So if things are too busy, too loud at the front desk and they need to work on something, they have a little bit more of a quieter space away from the desk um, back here. 
So in this, in this area, like I said, we polished up the original terrazzo flooring and we filled in some of these cracks that we had that you can kind of see. You'll see it better in the next slide, but we also polished up the bases of these columns and our marble staircase. And like I said, so our kitchenette, this is back where our kitchenette was. And so we moved that down to the lower level. The assistant director's desk actually used to be uh, right here and then we moved it back over here so it is a little nicer and out of the way you know I used to sit here for a very long time when I was the assistant director and it was sort of like people would see you right away and want to start talking to you so just a little bit more out of the way so this is the view of the original building right across from the desk so these are those column bases that I mentioned that we polished up and then also the uh marble staircase going up and down. So this leads up to the mezzanine. We have a little glass floor uh, mezzanine up here with some work tables. And then downstairs, it leads into our team room. And again, polished up those nice terrazzo floors. I don't know when the last time this was done. Um, I've been here since 2012 and none of us could really remember if it was ever done. And just a little neat background is when before we added on the additions in this space right here it used to have a nice big fireplace and you can kind of see right down here on the floor um, that's where the fireplace was and you can still kind of see where the the gas lamps we had gas lamps back in the day and these columns are hollowed out and you can kind of see right here where they used to be so we have a lot of people who like to visit and just see the architecture in here so this is up on the mezzanine. So before we had, again, just uh, really mismatched furniture and we have actually moved away from the desktop. So we, these were, this was a while ago, we've moved away back in 2017 and now we're strictly just laptops because these were just taking up way too much space that uh, we didn't have. And this is that really neat uh, glass floor. So we have people who love it or some people who are really nervous about uh, walking on it actually. <laughs> And uh, new tables and chairs up here, which will probably stay up here for a long time. It is very hard to move furniture up and down um, this space. This right here is uh, the director's office. So before it, it's a very small space and it was just absolutely dominated by this massive dark furniture and pretty much all the furniture that we had was really given to us from other offices nearby during updates. So a lot of secondhand furniture. So new paint, new furniture, and the removal of this oversized desk just really makes it feel much more spacious and, and brighter in here. And we have a little space. So we have a, a couple of seats, which you can't see over here for people who come in and, and want to be, uh, we do have that here still. This is again a staff area. This was that old kitchenette that I have been mentioning. And so the assistant director's desk used to be right here. So we removed that kitchenette and then we moved the assistant director's area back here. And just to the other side is that uh, second workspace for staff. I don't have any pictures of the kitchenette downstairs. It is such a small space. It is really hard to photograph, but we do now have a full fridge, a really good size sink and a dishwasher. So before we had the smallest sink in the world right here, and we had this little teeny cube fridge, which was like call it from a college dorm room that used to actually sit under the assistant director's desk and it could barely fit anything in it. So now that we have the kitchenette with fridge, sink, and we never had a dishwasher before, once we can get back to having programs with food and that, it will just be uh, so huge for us. Now getting down into the lower level 1956 edition. So down here, we have all new top and end panels on the shelving units. We also have two new um, mobile units, which we never had before. So this right here, and then just on the other side of this column. And we also decided to, you can't see it very well in this um, image, but the next one you will, we lowered the shelving height down here. So it was really tall before we decided, it, decided to lower it down for sight lines. We have some new comfortable seating here. Uh, so we removed that stairwell. So this was where you came down before uh, to get into this area through the main stairwell. We got rid of that. We kept this little wall here, but on the other side, what we did, this is the kids tech area. So we essentially bought some new tables and then moved this whole area onto this side um, right here. So we gained a huge amount of space here. And the kids tech area was also funded in large part to a local Rotary Club. So we were given $10,000 from local Rotary Clubs, Rotary Club of Mystic, Rotary Club of the Stoning Pins, and then a local Rotary uh, District. Michaela, if I can jump in. Um, yeah. Could we backtrack to one of the mezzanine slides? Yes. 
Because we do have a question that Denise answered in the chat too, but I okay. but I'd love to talk about it a little more from a library that also has a mezzanine that's not really accessible. There's no elevator up there, and just a question about your consultants and what they told you about accessibility to that space and ADA requirements and not having elevator access and how you use that space. Yeah, so the space, there's no way it's kind of like grandfathered in at this point, there's no way of gaining uh, proper ADA access without compromising the historic integrity of it. So we do have collections up here. So what's up here is actually our 800s and 900s and nonfiction. So we have people who even could use stairs, but you know, let me go back one slide. These are so narrow and steep. Uh, people do get really nervous about it. And we even kids love to run up and down them. And we are like, oh my goodness. So it is very nerve wracking. I will say that. But we, we as staff do say a lot of times, if you're not, if you don't want to go up there, we will go up and get the, get the books for you. And sometimes people are very nervous about this class floor. They just don't like how it is. So this space is not utilized as well as the main reading room. We have these tables up here, but I'm going to say um, what, since we removed these desktops, people used to come up and use the desktops, but this is not a space that most people, you know, go up and actually sit at very few. We have a few dedicated people who like to come up here and use it on a regular basis, but it is not nearly as well utilized as our main, uh, main reading room and those two work rooms in the back. And actually I should have pointed out over on this side, we have a really large work table and we used to have folding chairs around it before and used to sit at it and sort of feel like a, a kindergartner. So what we did was we purchased these chairs right here and put them all around that work table. But I will say it is, it's not well utilized um, up here by, by patrons. People definitely prefer to sit down on the, the regular level. And there's really nothing that could be done about improving access and being ADA compliant um, up here. I also wanted to jump in, which I did um, say in the chat, we don't use this for active programming. And the key is, is if you used it for active programming, the criteria for accessibility would shift. And um, as Michaela said, the collections up there, um, certainly over where that large table is, um, it's a poetry collection, which is um, to some extent, a little bit more restricted. So we're very careful about what we sort of put up to the mezzanine. And it is just such an integral part of the historic building. And it is not used for active programming. There was never really a consideration of whether we had to um, comply with the ADA for that area. Yes, I would say this is mostly utilized by staff and board and committee members. We do mm -hmm. meet at this larger table because it's one of the larger tables we have in the building. So we use it a lot. And actually we do not have like a staff place to eat lunch and things like that. So what we end up doing is coming up here and eating and kind of close. We have a little thing that we put during COVID just to not let other people go up there while we're, while we're eating. So it mostly utilized more often than not by staff uh, board volunteer committees versus the public. But we do have a few people who absolutely love to work up here on a regular basis. Does that answer the, the question? It does, thank you so much. You're welcome. And then let me go back to where I was. I think I was right here. So like, this is another view of the children's room. And so this is where you can really see how we had this really high shelving before and we lowered that and it just improved sight lines. I think these you know, new end panels that are really colorful. We put new paint down here. It does make it feel really bright, especially for being a, a basement level. Um, and then lots more display space, just like with upstairs. And this has really helped with circulation, both on the tops and the sides. We didn't have any end panels on these uh, before. They unfortunately, in those floods that I mentioned back in 2009, 2010, got destroyed and we just didn't have the the money to replace them because they were quite expensive. Another view in the children's room. This is a, a new work table. We already had these uh, chairs, so they match perfectly. So we kept those around. And this is that entrance uh, from the stairwell. So this is where you'd come in if you were using the stairwell instead of the elevator. 
and back to that back to that stairwell where it all began. So the stairwell with the old lift. So before the renovation, it was only used by staff or in the event of an emergency, which thankfully hasn't happened um, since I've been here, knock on wood. And it was really just industrial and honestly just dirty looking. Um, and so the lift was removed and then that wall was infilled. We received all new paint and flooring in this area. And then we also ended up turning it into a stairwell gallery. So this just helps it you know, be brighter and more friendly. And this was thanks to an anonymous donation from a community member. We unfortunately had a really beloved staff member pass away from cancer in 2019. And she wanted um, us to do something in her honor. And she was just a, a big artist. So we decided we were gonna collaborate with the schools and the art teachers. So what's going to rotate around here pretty much on a quarterly basis is just art from, from the school. So a nice little outreach and collaboration activity. And it just, it's now the main stairwell between the two levels if people don't wanna use the elevator. So now I will pass it back over to Denise. I've talked quite a bit. I'm unmuting. Oh, uh, terrific. Thank you. I, we invite somebody said, oh, we'll have to come visit. Please do come visit and let us know ahead of time so that you can um, chat with Michaela and the rest of the staff. Um, so I <clears throat> there to circle back um, a little bit, not for the project, but again, it was this what I call the perfect timing for everything. We knew that we needed to do the addition. And this is where it segues into the interior refurbishment. At the same time, the um, there was an announcement regarding or an outreach request for proposals for um, from the Connecticut State Library for the renovation. And we were a little, and I'm going to be very honest, it was like, we're doing this addition, we have this renovation, we know we have to do it. And the question was, where, how do we stage it? So there was phase one, and then we knew that there was going to be a phase two, but we weren't quite sure when the phase two was going to happen. And the key to all of this was that we decided that we would look at the biggest picture first, and then we would look, then we would sort of encompass what we could with reasonableness based on granting opportunities and then the decision by the board to do the capital campaign. And the, we, we've one good news is we reached our um, goals, but then even more importantly, we were very transparent throughout the entire process. And that was as much as anything else to let the campaign committee, let the community, let our funding sources um, become part of the process and guide us as we were going through. So the board had approved $890,000 for the entire project. And we came in pretty much $100 under, under, under project approval. So, um, and that, that was, and do we have the next slide, Michaela? Perfect. Um, and this, this was related to um, the raising the money and also what the campaign goals were. Again, remember the sustainability. So we knew that as we were going to um, go out for the capital campaign, we wanted the community to know how we were going to be spending the money and where our funding sources were. And so there was a meticulous sort of path forward. And I think that what we should say at this point in time is we had extraordinarily, extraordinarily generous volunteers who jumped into the process. Um, Michaela talked about having project plans. We had a retired project manager <laughs> from Pfizer who said, I will join the building committee and I will put together these plans and we'll run the project as if we were working for Pfizer. That made a huge difference. We had a construction company who did very large projects and was not in a position to um, manage this project, obviously, but who came in and gave us access to their bidding and to their estimate proposal software. And that was really beneficial. And then the building committee itself, it was a full-time job for everybody. And in large part because of COVID, we were in a position where we weren't really doing a lot of other things. So it really did become a morning, afternoon, and evening 
on-site conversation, jumping in, hauling things to the, um, the landfill. And it really became an effort that um, everybody felt very vested and engaged in the process. And the granting from the donors and grants um, outside of the municipal funding and the state library grant was really incremental. And at any point in time, they were obviously with COVID restrictions, were invited to come and see sort of the progress that was happening, but also they were aware of how we were um, allocating and spending the money that um, we had. So that I think is a really important thing. The board, every meeting, we spent a fair amount of time um, going through what was happening, what the budgets were, and um, the line items literally were shared as extensively as we could. Um, the next slide. So um, I will um, turn this back over to Michaela, but I think part of it was at each stage of the process and the project, we were very aware of what our timing was. And um, again, kudos to the staff because we wanted to be able to make sure <laughs> that we were keeping the library open as much as possible. So in conjunction with um, COVID restrictions, we also had set up what I will call sort of extraordinary outreach. So um, we communicated extensively with the community, even when we had books um, sort of not accessible, we had the books that we thought were most popular accessible so <laughs> that we could be running them out the front door, masks on, putting them in bags, putting them in the back seat or the trunk of our, um, of our patrons. And at we so many people said we never felt that the library wasn't there for us and that to me was re really the success of um, the staff and success of what we were trying to do so that when we did reopen and we were able to you know say to the public here's what we did they recognized the fact that this was magnificent but equally important was the fact that we never quote unquote, close them out from what was happening at the library. So I'm going to turn this over to Michaela to add anything else to the schedule. Yes, I was just going to point out that, you know, a good part of the addition and the renovation was obviously completed during COVID, um, like Denise mentioned, and we were able to stay on time and on budget despite that. We definitely ran into supply chain issues, which we keep hearing about, and then contractor staffing challenges. And one of the things that did come up is we did have to reselect a number of items due to supply chain issues, so which was kind of, we had worked so hard on choosing these things so long ago. We we're like, oh, we got everything one wonderfully, but then all of a sudden we couldn't get the roof shingles. We couldn't get the correct color for the ramp that we wanted. We had to change out bathroom tiles and carpet. So there was a lot of that um, that went on so that we could stay um, on time. I will say one of the silver linings being close to the public during the project, it wasn't a bad thing. There were several times where I said, oh my goodness, how would we have handled this if we had uh, people in the building? And I really think that our weekly meetings with contractors and the committee members was really key. As Denise already mentioned, Rory's project management skills and spreadsheets were amazing. John served as our owner's rep during the renovation and he had architectural background. We had George who had great connections to the town, which was very helpful. And then Denise has construction management background as well, which was a huge plus. So one of the downsides, like I had mentioned earlier, was that for many months after we reopened here, we had to store lots of the new furniture due to social distancing. So from probably about October to March, 2020. Um, and we actually still don't even have out the new kids play table that we got or the new little toy storage unit because we're just not doing that in the kids room yet. And then all that wonderful expanded space and flexible furniture for in-person programming wasn't being utilized as much because uh, most of our programs were virtual. So it was a little disheartening. We had gone through all of this and then we had to store it away for quite a while, but now we're we're getting back and it is being used so it's, it's been great and this was that uh, slide I was talking about that I was going to go over some of our contractors if anyone's interesting so like I 
mentioned Do Right Design out of West Hartford. They were our architects, Steve Dewey specifically for the addition and renovation. G Donovan Associates, they were our contractors for the addition. They are out of North Franklin, I believe. We had Frank Zeno and Associates, they were our contractors for the renovation. Uh, Deanna Dewey from 4D Design and Decorating. She's out of West Hartford as well, and she was our interior designer. We worked with Rob Romay from Robert H. Lord as our furniture vendor, and then Mike Human from, it was WB Mayor, now I think they're just Mayor, they're out of Stratford, and they were our moving and storage contractors, so we did move a huge amount of our collections, and then some of the furniture that we were going to keep out of the building, and then it all came back in. And then Red Thread out of East Hartford, they were our contractors for the installation of the carpet tiles and the BCT tiles. And then I will turn it back over to Denise for, for the slide. So I can't say enough that it was a community effort. We were a team. And that was from the very beginning, from the very first strategic plan all the way through today. And it continues as we look into what's, what's next. Um, and I, I believe that there, it's hard. We should have just had all of these sort of posted all over the slide because there's no hierarchy here. The board of trustees was very involved and they did roll up their sleeves and they did participate in the whole project to the extent that they could physically or with contributions and reaching out to the community to keep the information flowing and then with the capital campaign. So we really need to recognize it, that that component of it. The building committee and community volunteers, um, there was absolutely no way we could have done it within the time schedule and the budget um, being on track without people volunteering countless hours. So we were very, very fortunate not to have to hire a construction manager as part of the process. But I do want to say that part of what allowed us to do that was this meticulous attention to detail and this construction management company who um, sort of guided us so that as we got the estimates, we were very clear on what they were going to do and we held them accountable to it. You can't do anything without staff. That's the bottom line. And part of the reason why it's right there in the middle is that is the key to the whole project. Our funders and donors and our community um, we're just really, we're really fortunate to have um, a very engaged community who recognizes the value of the library. And again, I can't emphasize enough the fact that we did everything and continue to do everything to keep the library accessible. Um, I mentioned that we're open seven days a week. That was a big push for us um, because we want people to recognize that we just didn't do this to be a showcase as people drive into the community. This is really a place where, and now if we can start to have our programming be expanded and open and in the library, we want this to be the center of the community where we're bringing people together and we're offering them any number of opportunities in which they can engage with what we offer inside and outside. And we hadn't talked about this, but the big push um, simultaneously was how do we um, sort of align our digital library services and our physical library services. And we, you know, people have just given us a lot of kudos for being able to do that effectively, not sort of emphasizing one or the other, but recognizing that they work together. Denise, if I can jump in and ask a question sure. about your building committee and all those wonderful volunteers you had, the retired Pfizer person, were these all people who were already known to you? Were they already patrons? Were they already on the board? How did you hook up with them and pull them into the fold? Um, so George Sylvester was a board member who had, you know, sort of termed out, if you may, and he had worked in the um, town, had a lot of what I would call sort of local connections. And when I joined the board, I was very interested in the building community um, committee, partially because I'm um, an architectural historian fan and this building was just so magnificent and so I felt that I could contribute from that perspective so it was just a committee of two 
and Michaela for a number of years. When we decided to take this on, there was um, absolutely <laughs> no way that George and Denise and Michaela could manage this project. Um, Rory Cotton and John Malmrose are both volunteers at the library, and Rory had supported a number of other projects with her meticulous um, project management and process skills. And um, during one of our meetings, um, Michaela had mentioned Rory, and we reached out to her. And her husband happens to be John, who at the same time, again, just wonderful circumstances, was very much um, interested and came on during the interior refurb refurbishment. And he had the um, bandwidth and the skills to also be sort of our owner's rep during that process, because it was a pretty short time frame in which we had finished the exterior, which is a different sort of project. I mean, it requires a different level of engagement. And the interior, we knew that we had to be very sensitive to what already existed and also to stage it. You move the, you know, the furniture and the books in, you have to do the painting and the electric and, and everything was, if anything sort of quote unquote fell off schedule, there was the potential that other things um, would sort of fall off schedule. And when Michaela said, yeah, we had to make some decisions regarding, um, you know, differences in tile or color or carpeting or whatever. And um, just, a, just a thought that you don't need to be perfect. You need to be almost perfect. And um, absolutely, I can't even remember, and I would probably um, throw this challenge to Michaela, what the original carpet selection was versus what we had. We looked at the both of them, we made the adjustments, and the key criteria was to make sure that it would meet the overall design aesthetic, but also that it would meet the budget considerations. And fortunately, we had options, and it wasn't as if, you know, you know, the elevator couldn't come in. And it, I think that that, um, so that's where, you know, ongoing weekly meetings, but daily conversations throughout the whole process. And so George, um, George and Rory and John were instrumental. And I wasn't joking that George has a pickup truck and we would literally haul things, put them in the pickup truck. And then he and John would go to the landfill. And part of that was because we were really sensitive to keeping things on schedule, but also, um, you know, getting the things done that had to get done. And so we were all in a position that we could do that, which um, I'm actually very proud of our clean, clean out and hauling, and hauling skills. But if you don't ask, you don't know what people will do to, to participate. And that brings us to the end and we are happy to answer any questions. We do have another question in the chat about uh, if you would remind us of the square footage of the addition, but then also what that meant in terms of square footage you could gain back elsewhere. Yes, so it was square footage of the addition. We added on 700 square feet, so 350 square feet on each level. And then in the renovation, we gained 575 square feet that was previously being used as something else. So over a thousand square feet. And I think the total square footage now is like 5,171 square feet throughout the entire building. I'm pretty sure it's about that. Great. And Michaela, we've, we've kind of touched on this a little bit here and there as we go along. And part of the answer is having a fabulous building committee. But could you also talk about what it's like as a director to manage a construction and renovation project like this? and concurrently layering on COVID and all the other things that are happening. Just how that management process worked, what your time looked like, how much time you were allocating to this versus sort of library business, how all that worked out as a director's point of view. Yes, it was an incredible amount of work. I will not lie about that. It was, you know, very long weeks. It's on call 24 seven because contractors, even though they, you know, we thankfully could um, attack, go to our, uh, little security system through my phone so I could unalarm the building for them. So this is like waking up at six in the morning to unalarm the building. They have keys, but they don't have the security codes sort of a thing. And then 
Uh, so it was just, it was a huge drop between that, between COVID, between trying to figure out, you know, when do you open the building back up? How do you do curbside pickup? Uh, it was, it was a huge amount of work. I won't lie, but most of the time it was dominated by this project. Um, that's, that's for sure. I would say most of my time was spent on this, but it was so great again to have all the other team. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do it without them, the building building committee and that. And so at the time I actually was assistant director. So just to remind everyone of that. So it was Belinda Decay at the time was the director. So we uh, were a wonderful team. She wanted to see this project through before she retired. So that was what she wanted to do before she retired. So I was the assistant director throughout this. And then Belinda was the director. And then once this all finished up, I have been the director for just over uh, a year now. Um, so we really did split the time um, between the two of us, which was very helpful. So great team there. And then again, Denise thankfully lives uh, just down the road too. So she's like, you know, she could run right across the street here, which is, which is very helpful. But yes, it is definitely a, a lot of work. I will not lie about that. There were many, many long weeks throughout this. Most of my time was definitely spent on this and then trying to manage everything with COVID and, and all of that. It, it, it's a lot of work. You really have to be committed to it. And let's talk about COVID again. And you, you, I have addressed this a little bit before, but you, we didn't know COVID was going to happen when you started this project. Um, and so, of course, we have to integrate and we have to react and we have to deal with the conditions that we've got. But how much did your original plan change because of COVID and closures and all of those issues that came up? Actually, honestly, not much at all. And uh, that's just, I don't know if we were incredibly lucky besides just here and there, we had some shortages in contract for staff because of being exposed to COVID. And then we had to make some of those decisions on changing things out. But um, thankfully our interior designer and our architect kind of said, okay, well, you have to change this out. Here are the options. So pick something and it'll you know, go make your budget go up or down or stay, you know, in line and, um, you know, also is, is very similar. So working with them to figure out those were great. So we really did stay on time and on budget. I think we were thinking maybe we would end like the end of September, early October. We went a little later into, into October, but somehow we were very lucky where it could have been, um, you know, a, a lot worse. I, I do feel um, hearing about other, other stories. And anytime you do what sounds like a simple um, upgrade, like carpeting throughout the building or paint throughout the building, it's actually a huge impact on, on the physical space. And I see Denise nodding because you know where I'm going, because you basically have to empty all of those spaces in order to do the work you want to do. So it becomes this incredibly intensive, labor-intensive project to, to pull everything out and then put it back. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you use that opportunity to really rethink what you put back in there? Oh yeah, so I did not mention before, we did a very big weeding project um, as part of this, definitely, um, because you'll see, so in the, and then I'll go back a little bit, in the 1990 edition where we have those big tall stacks before, we obviously, and we do get these comments from people, we obviously lost shelving space um, back there. So here we lost a lot of shelving space because we did go down, we stepped down here, but honestly we did regain a lot of shelving space um, over in here. So it, it sort of evened out, but we did do a massive weeding project as part of this. Things we haven't looked at in a while, we needed to rearrange where, you know, fiction started. Fiction used to start um, back over in this area here, now fiction starts in the in the middle of this room. So we had to rearrange where a lot of our collections were and uh, making it all fit back on the shelves was definitely interesting. We did end up uh, doing it, but we did have to go through a big big weeding project. And um, a lot of the furniture we decided to, you know, give away to other good homes. Uh, one of the unfortunate things during COVID was that most people were not taking like upholstered furniture and things like that. So it was, it was hard to see some of it just end up going, but um, it was just, you know, at that time, people were not taking things because of all the uncertainty in that. 
but yes, moving moving things in and out of the building was definitely a, a big project. We did have a mayor, but they needed some instruction. We did have to do help with like labeling of boxes, putting signs all around the stack saying, this is where this should start. This is where this should start, which was also difficult. Um, and we did have to make some adjustments here and there, but that was a, a big portion of, of the project. And one of the other things is that uh, during the renovation, as Denise mentioned, it was wonderful to have John as our volunteer owner's rep. But during the addition, we had the contractor who really scheduled, this is when this is going to happen. This is when this is going to happen. And mm -hmm. we did not have to worry about that. But during the renovation, you know, we had our contractors, uh, Frank Zeno, who were doing some of the electrical and then, you know, the removal of spaces and that. But then we had hired another contractor to do the carpeting and we had hired, uh, you know, mayor to come and move things in and out. So all of these we had to figure out. Then we had the people who were coming in to polish the original floor. So we had to figure out how to time those things um, perfectly. And so John was a, a huge help with that because we just mm -hmm. didn't have that same level of, you know, a, as with the addition with the contractor handling pretty much everything. We had many different um, contractors for the renovation. Mm -hmm. And this is a this is sort of a segue and it addresses, I think, what Marie had just asked. It gave us also an opportunity to rethink how people were using the exterior space of the library and Michaela mentioned at the very beginning that we had a fiber grant and that was really essential so as we look forward we have been very conscious of the fact that people like to in the good weather like to work outside and then COVID was just reinforcing the fact that people would bring their you know sort of their lawn chairs <laughs> Um, and with their laptops, and it became sort of this exterior office. And so we have been conscious of how we can support that. And the fiber grant has allowed us to do that. So there's always this mix of how people are accessing information and the materials and resources we offer, where they're accessing them, and how they come in and out. So it, it's been sort of this really interesting juxtaposition and COVID helped us to some extent reimagine that part of how we service the community. And not that we weren't always going to do that, but it became a higher priority. Yep, we definitely expanded our digital library significantly, as most libraries have. We added things like Canopy, Hoopla, um, expanded our, our Libby app that we already had more. So there was a lot of that going on because, you know, like I said, most of our collections moved out. So even when we were opening, you had open for curbside service only, we did not, we had a very limited number of books that were actually available for people to, to pick up um, because the vast majority of the collections were gone. I think we only had our, our new books, which were in the original building, biographies, the 800s and 900s on up on the mezzanine. That was really it. Everything in this room right here and in the 90s edition where our main stacks are uh, was, was gone from the building. So digital library was definitely uh, the way to go. And in fact, when I drove past the library and past the square, I would see benches right up on the square, all around the square, people sitting there. And you had those really cool signs that you just plunked out there that said, what, free Wi-Fi zone, right? Yes. Yep. So um, another thing that we did, um, this is this came a little after the this this whole project was that um, the Everyone Learns initiative. So through CEN, we were able to have that booster installed on on the so we have this this box outside now that sits on the front of the building, which actually John Malmrose painted perfectly to match the the brick on the building. That extends uh, our Wi-Fi actually. Or, all across through the park and then over on the other side of High Street, which is where we're located. So we bought those little lawn signs and put them out all over the place so people knew that uh, they could get our Wi-Fi for free all throughout the park. So with adding all the digital materials and, and providing this great new space, have your patrons noticed that you've weeded materials? Have they missed anything that you've weeded? No, no, but some some do say when they see the stacks in this picture right here, oh my gosh, you must have had to get rid of a lot of books. And I say, yes, we did get rid of some things, but just remember that we lost space here, but we gained space, you know, in the other room. So, you know, we, we did do a big weeding project, but we hadn't done a big weeding project in a while. So it was definitely um, necessary. And 
No, because then we say, and then that's okay, we can just interlibrary loan it from another library, or, you know, if we really feel we need to repurchase it, you know, we will. So mm -hmm. not too much. Some comments in the beginning, but it has definitely uh, gone away. And then once the renovation was done and the fundraising was done, you actually expanded hours. You added some hours on some days and expanded into Sundays. How did that happen? How was that funded and how's it been working out and how are the patrons responding? So another thing that we did during the strategic planning process, that whole thing about we need to, you know, advocate more with the town and get some more funding. So uh, we didn't get more funding the year we started this advocacy project, but they and the Board of Finance ended up deciding to uh, create a library task force. And we were able to meet with uh, a few members of the Board of Finance on a regular basis before um, one of the municipal funding years. I can't quite remember. I'm gonna say 2017, 2018-ish. And um, after, so Stonington funds three libraries. They fund us, they fund the Westerly Library because Pawkatuck is part of Stonington and Pawkatuck residents can just pretty much walk over to the Westerly Library and they also fund uh, Mystic Knowing Library. So all three libraries got together with uh, Board of Finance members and uh, we were able to educate them on all that the libraries have to offer. And we ended up getting a big bump the following year in municipal funding and what we wanted to do and what we told the Board of Finance we would do with that funding would be to uh, expand ours. So obviously right when we got the funding it was uh, 2020 and we were did not want to expand ours in the middle of COVID so we talked with them and we eventually did it and the other part of this is we also applied for two rounds of PPP funding. So that helped expand ours. And then also this bump from the capital campaign. So any money not spent on the building project went into our endowment. So we are now have a little bit more that we're gaining from the endowment for annual uh, funding each year. So it was all of those factors that we were able to finally uh, expand ours. So we added on an additional 10 hours a week. We went until seven now, Monday through Thursday and Saturdays, we were 10 to one before, went to 10 to three, and we are now open for the first time that I know of on Sundays from 10 to three as well. Love it. We have answered all the questions that are currently in the chat, but I'm going to keep giving people more time to ask some questions there. But Michaela, you had mentioned earlier that you've got some fabulous photos on your library website. Yes, so I can, I'm going to get out of that share screen and then go and share just my regular screen so I can show you all of that. And in the meantime, I'm going to encourage everybody to go ahead and think your questions, type them in. We do still have a little bit more time. And if you find that typing your question is a little cumbersome, just go ahead and raise your Zoom hand or raise your virtual hand or turn your mic on and just go ahead and call out your question and, and give us an ask. So hopefully everyone is now seeing my um, Google Chrome browser. And so this is yep. the library website, stonyfinfreelibrary.org. And if you go under what's happening here, I could not fit all of the, the photos in today's presentation, but if you click on construction here, um, we have a little page and there is going to be a link where if you scroll down here, it says, see all of our construction photos here. And we gave everyone access to this. So these are just Google Drive folders and you can see more photos of the renovation project, things I didn't fit in today. You can see it actually you know, happening and and things like, here's all our videos of when people were moving things in and out um, of the building when Meyer was doing all of that. And then um, some of the photos, you know, right after we reopened, it's a little before and afters of things. So these are those chairs. I didn't show a picture, but these are those nice comfy chairs with all the electrical outlets and the, and the USB ports, some of our kitchenette in here. So if you want to go through this, it's just an actual, you know, real in time happening of when this was all occurring. A big, big mess. Oh, and here is, is Belinda and I. So we moved our, I'll show this. We moved our desks every which way uh, throughout this process. We were in, uh, it was a weekly thing. We were staged in a new area depending on what was happening in the building. So this is pretty much everything emptied out. And this is when uh, they were polishing that original floor. But when they were putting the carpet tiles down, we had to move from here to the back and then out of the way for them to do that. So fun memories. And then we also have the addition in here. So actual pictures of the addition and construction happening here. 
And then some of the, some more before photos. So I grabbed a lot of these photos that were from my slideshow today from here. That's something we always forget to do is sort of document the process as it's happening, right? Because you're so busy in it, you forget to take the pictures. But mm -hmm. was that something that you like specifically put on your calendar? Like, hey, go take pictures today. How do you? Yes, I tried to do it in um, my, so our development uh, director, Stephanie Calhoun was pretty much, I need pictures to put on the website. And so she was a big person uh, to remind me on a regular basis. Oh, take some photos and videos of what's happening um, today so that we have them um, just, you know, helping on social media gaining interest and then also you know helped out for the capital campaign as well so thank you stephanie for reminding me on a regular basis and then i was going to just quickly show since we have a little bit of time so this is this is uh we were talking about rory and her spreadsheets and that and then i'm happy to share but this is one of the things that rory met on a weekly basis and she is so organized this whole spreadsheet with our meeting on a regular basis updating it assigning people to it you know, putting our deadlines in here, this just really kept us on track. Um, this was for the, the renovation project. And then if I can get Zoom to move out of my way here so I can get to my tabs, I will show you too just a couple of other things. So this is kind of, we met on a regular basis. We always had an agenda and who was gonna talk about which items. And then we also asked our contractors. We Our contractors are part of those weekly updates. So we always asked them to provide us with this, you know, what did you achieve this last week or are you going to achieve this week? What do you have planned for the next couple of weeks? And then risks, concern and opportunities. So um, we had them filling this out for a regular basis. So we knew what was what was going on. So There's very a great helpful. question in the chat about even with all of this amazing planning, amazing planning. Were you surprised or unprepared for any part of this process? <laughs> yeah, there were surprises, you know, on a, on a regular basis, but um, we're, it happens, even though you're so well organized, there are things here and there, just like what I said with some of the, some of the materials not being available or suddenly, you know, there's a, a COVID sickness on the contractor mm -hmm. staff, but um, it all, it, we, we made it through. Do you want to respond, Denise? Um, yeah, I do want to respond because I think that, it, it, I mean, we were, we were prepared to be surprised if that makes if that makes sense and part of it again was just being very transparent and having as many people involved in the process as, as possible we're we're a pretty small community so it was it wasn't as if we had lots of different disparate um people who were making comments or who were making decisions and all of the decision makers from the board to to the funders to the community everybody knew what was happening and when there was something that was unplanned we immediately made sure that everybody um, again was part of the process and that's when people jumped in and I had mentioned this um, large construction company who jumped in because we had gotten some um, surprising initial rounds of quotes and they just didn't make sense and they were not detailed. And um, as Michaela said, you know, the, the building committee had enough experience to recognize that you can't just have five line items with the bottom line. And so we knew that we would have to go into greater detail and how to manage that process to be able to do apple to apple comparisons. So at that point in time was when we, when George actually reached out to this individual and they were willing to do that um, as a, you know, as a, as a in-kind service to the library, which was terrific. But I'd also like to um, note the second question because I think that's really important. Again, um, the staff is as much a part of the decision making and considerations in the library as anybody else, and that includes, you know, major funders, <laughs> our community, um, our board. So, um, you know, Belinda McKay and Michaela are just really, and I can't say enough, um, you know, they've got everybody's back. And having that was um, really essential. And I hope that they believed. And I think Michaela, I mean, we became, you know, these joint people. I mean, we had their back. So um, at any point in time, and we all have things. We have, you know, family issues that come up and there's COVID issues that come up. 
but um, I don't think at any point in time anybody felt that they didn't have the support that they needed. Um, and yes, there were changes in chaos. And, um, you know, we were sounding very happy and very much in control. But I have to admit that there were a few times that I had a meltdown. <laughs> and Belinda said, yes, this is very emotional, Denise. And I, I say that because, um, and I know this is being recorded, we're humans. And that's a really important thing to recognize. And so to whatever extent people have to be able to share um, you know, their concerns, their fears, whatever the case may be. But if that space is, is available and everybody knows that we're going to get through this as a team, um, we did not have to um, really do anything above just saying, okay, let's have a cup of tea and then we move on. And I don't know if you'd like to answer that as well, Michaela, but. Yeah, no, I'll just, I've been thinking of a few examples of things that happened, but exactly as Denise described it, we had like all this asbestos testing and all this kind of testing. And we're like, oh, there's none of that around in here. And then there was one landing in the stairwell, like probably a four by four thing that had asbestos. So that held things up for a little bit. And then, so I mentioned Belinda and I having to move our desks around. That was not going to happen originally, but we had a change where all of a sudden the contractor who was going to polish uh, the terrazzo floor needed to change. So guess what? We had the people polishing the terrazzo floor and the people installing the carpeting tile at the same exact time. That was not supposed to happen. We were supposed to be done with the polishing of the terrazzo floor. Belinda and I could stay in there and then the carpet people could go and do their thing. So Belinda and I had to move our desks three different times to because the carpeting needed to be done first in the 1956 edition. So we moved into the back, then they needed to go over into the 90s. So it's just all, there was definitely a lot of stuff that um, we planned and planned for. This is when it's gonna happen. This is when it's gonna happen. And something slightly changed with the contractor and we had to, we had to deal with it. And there were also some things contractors had accidentally thrown out that were not supposed to be thrown out, which really, uh, was probably the most stressful part of it, but uh, you know, all the contractors we worked with were wonderful and they did get it back even if it, it took a while, but that was another thing. Some stuff was thrown out that shouldn't have been and that was another very stressful situation, but ultimately it all worked out in the end. We have answered all of the questions that have come up in the chat. There's a brand new one. Did you need to close to the public at all? And if so, for how long? How did that work out? Or was it just COVID that happened? And yeah, so that, one of the silver linings, so we started the edition in November 2019. And then in March 2020, like most places, we did close to the building to the public. Before that, we were open um, all the time. Uh, but even if we hadn't been closed to the public during COVID, during the renovation, we absolutely would have uh, had to been closed for some period of time. The thing with the asbestos, the when we had to move everything in and out, we could not have been open during that. Because of all the electrical work we were doing, we didn't have power in the building for a few days here and there. So that also, we would not have been able to uh, have people in the building then. So one silver lining, like I mentioned, uh, there were a few times where I said, oh my goodness, how would we have been open during this? That would have uh, been creative. I think we would have had to be either completely closed or just have certain parts of the building open. Like the original building probably could have stayed open for most of the time other than like asbestos and electrical work when we didn't have power. And then also when th the days things were actually being moved out and moved in were just too chaotic to have to have people in there. So we definitely would have had to been closed for, for some time. And then we reopened for curbside pickup only in on June 1st, 2020. Um, and then we did a limited reopening between when the addition ended and the renovation began. And that was in August, 2020. So we let people who had uh, also donated to the capital campaign and members of the public come in to just see the addition before the renovation began. And then we closed again uh, for curbside only until the end of the renovation, which was the end of October, 2020. Thank you both so much. You're getting lots of thanks in the chat. And I'd like to say thank you as well to Michaela and Denise for your time, for your experience, for all of your expertise and for practicing your presentation and putting so many great things together for us. It was really wonderful, so helpful, some great information. Um, and you may be hearing, I think, from some people who attended today as well if they have follow-up questions. So I really appreciate that. But 
Thank you both so much for being here. Um, I'm going to send the recording link out at about 1230 today. Hopefully I'll have the recording up. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. We'll see you again. Thank you, Bye -bye. Maria. And then I will get back thank to you. you. If, you remember, if you remember who asked a question about the um, tables, I'll look back and see who made those tables. I can't remember yep. off the top of my head. Yep, yep. I and can. I just put my email in the chat. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you. And thank you, Maria. Yes, thank you, Maria. Thanks.